in the world of haute couture. Dynasty, Dallas, uh, Falcon Crest, you say it can never happen in real life. Oh, yes. Everything was possible. A hot-blooded family feud. Too much infighting and litigation amongst themselves eventually brought down the whole house of Gucci. And in the wings, a woman whose appetite for money couldn't be satisfied. She did have a sense that she could do whatever she wanted and that she was above the law. High fashion and low-down revenge, Italian style. Tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. March 27th, 1995, Milan, Italy, 8.30 a.m. Maurizio Gucci takes his morning stroll to the office. A year and a half after being ousted as chairman of his family's famous fashion empire, he spends his days looking for a way to make his next million. As he enters the building, someone walks up behind him and fires three shots. Gucci falls to the ground, gravely wounded. But dead men tell no tales. The assassin fires a fourth bullet into his head for good measure. A man appears around the corner. The killer spins and sends two bullets his way, hitting him in the arm. The shooter runs for a waiting getaway car and disappears into the streets of Milan. When I heard that one of the Gucci's was gunned down, my first thought wasn't, did he have any enemies, but which enemy actually pulled the trigger? To have a killing you know, this brutal in the middle of the day in Milan, immediately the association is mafia. Investigators arrive at the scene and pour over the evidence. At first, it looks like a typical mob execution, but that theory quickly unravels. Ten minutes after the homicide, I investigated the crime scene and decided it had no signs of organized crime, but rather of improvisers. Those who practice homicide professionally do anything to avoid being first of all noticed and then recognized. In this case, there were three witnesses. With a mob hit ruled out, the Carabinieri wonder if the murder could be connected to the celebrated Gucci empire. The world of the elite, you know, the world of the rich, the world of the famous. But who says the rich and famous don't behave badly? Investigators didn't have to dig too deep into the Gucci family to find turmoil. When Maurizio Gucci was killed, there was some speculation that it could have been a family vendetta. There was also fierce acrimony between Gucci and his ex-wife, Patrizia. Hatred that still burned nearly a decade after he walked out on her. Patrizia began to feel, I wouldn't call it hate, but constant resentment. Fashionistas don't normally shy away from big headlines, but when one of their royal family is killed, they instantly close ranks. Still, behind doors, tongues were wagging. It's one thing if a person passes away, but the way it happens, so being shot. And then this mystery starts to become enacted. All of Italy wanted to know who killed Maurizio Gucci. I never got tired of hearing about the Gucci family fights. I remember one story where workmen at the Gucci headquarters found the lawn littered with $500 handbags. It turns out 
The family members upstairs were hurling the bags at each other, and some sailed out the window. If the Carbonieri were going to crack this case, they needed to know everything about the family business. 1921, the Gucci company was born in Florence, Italy. Here, Guccio Gucci started a modest leather goods shop to cater to the city's elite. He took advantage of the area's long history of artisanship. Over the next two decades, Gucci leather grew and flourished. Guccio's three sons joined the family business, and soon there was talk of expansion. When the founder of the company wanted to just stay in Florence, the sons were going, let's go to New York, let's open a shop in New York. And Guccio Gucci was saying, why do we have to do that? Let's just stay in Italy. But the sons recognized that moving to New York was important. It would give you access to a whole wider world of fashion. The expansion brought Gucci a swanky new clientele. Around the world, Gucci shoes and handbags became status symbols. And the Gucci's themselves became the toast of the jet set. Movie stars like Frank Sinatra, uh, Sammy Davis Jr. wore these shoes. And when you have members of the Gucci family with celebrities, with this princess, with this countess, I mean, this becomes very addictive. A delicate balance of power had been worked out at the company. But that balance was thrown off when one brother had three sons and the other had only one, Maurizio. Maurizio really grew up as a very lonely, kind of sad, isolated little boy. And he was an only child. His mother died when he was five years old. His father was extremely protective of him. Because Maurizio was an only child, the Gucci balance of power would be tested. Maurizio and his father owned half the company. Maurizio's uncle and three cousins had to divide the other half. Gucci is like a lot of family businesses in Italy where you have, a, you know, a lot of heirs. And, you know, once you get to that second, third generation, what happens is all the, uh, uh, the uh, shares of the company are split so that, you know, you have all these different kind of fiefdoms that often occur in different companies. Although the business was all in the family, the money was not. Many financial secrets were hidden from the younger generation, and soon, Paolo Gucci started prying. He wanted to know why in 1978, the Gucci shops in the US did $48 million in sales, but showed no profits. What Paolo didn't know was that most of the money was being siphoned into offshore accounts by his uncle and father. The animosity built until Paolo uncovered documents exposing his papa's creative accounting and sent them to U.S. courts. Because of his own son, 81-year-old Aldo Gucci would spend a year in a Florida jail. But Paolo wasn't the only young Gucci stirring up trouble. Maurizio, the shy and unassuming cousin, had fallen for a woman named Patrizia Reggiani. She was allegedly born the love child of a waitress and a trucking baron. Her mother's subsequent marriage to the trucking king ensured Patrizia a life of wealth and privilege. Maurizio was smitten with this Elizabeth Taylor lookalike. His father, Rodolfo, wasn't. Rodolfo was concerned that, that Patrizia was really a gold digger and that she didn't care about Maurizio as much as his name and his fortune. And he didn't like her, he didn't trust her. Standing up to his father for the first time, Maurizio married Patrizia. It was months before Rodolfo would speak to Maurizio again and welcome him back into the family business. In the meantime, Patrizia went to work sculpting her masterpiece. Her goal? To turn meek Maurizio into a corporate lion. She honed his business skills and introduced him to the social elite, but the Gucci's never accepted her. She fit into the social scene, but she did not fit into the family. She was uh, considered a prima donna, absolutely egocentric, 
Just think of an outsider coming into this clan who already had its problems. She comes along and decides that I'm going to take over. I'm the reference point, il punto di riferimento. A son fighting for a place in the family business, a scheming wife sharpening her husband's claws, five angry relatives manning their battle stations. It was a recipe for disaster. In 1995, the shooting death of former Gucci chairman Maurizio Gucci shocked his native Italy and the world of fashion. Suspicion immediately went to his relatives. Anyone familiar with the Gucci's knew that in their world, money always trumped family. They were a very litigious, sort of out of control family. Where there were times when between the United States and uh, Europe, there were more than 20 lawsuits raging, you know, at a given time. With six Gucci sitting on the board, there just wasn't enough power to go around. The gloves were off. Spurred on by his ambitious wife, Maurizio Gucci was poised to make a power grab that would leave his cousins in the dust. You'd think these bitter public battles would have hurt the company, but the more the Gucci name was splashed across the tabloids, the more the public wanted to be seen in those trademark double Gs. But popularity doesn't always breed success. The Gucci's began licensing their trademark to nearly anyone willing to pay. The bad blood came to a head in July of 1982, when Paolo started to take matters into his own hands at a company meeting. The whole family united to go over the accounts, and Paolo showed up with a tape recorder. And there are various versions of what exactly happened. Some say that Maurizio was trying to hold the Paolo back, and some say that Giorgio was trying to grab the tape recorder. And the result of this scuffle was that uh, Paolo got a deep scratch on his face um, near the eye area. And at that point, started screaming and grabbed his tape recorder and ran out of the building on uh, Via Tornabuoni in downtown Florence. People like to look at the rich and see that they're not particularly happy with it. There was a family so successful and they're all tearing each other to shreds and in the process bringing down the money that held them all together. The day after the tape recorder incident, Paolo filed a multi-million dollar lawsuit against his relatives. But there were bigger problems in the house of Gucci. In just a few years, their image had gone from Rodeo Drive to Main Street, USA. So it's like they were drug addicts, addicted to the easy money coming in from licensing and then fighting over the money, but losing prestige because when cheaper and cheaper items had the double G's on them, suddenly it was no longer jet set, it was kind of a joke. The Gucci cousins were happy selling their wares on the mass market, as long as the cash kept rolling in. But Maurizio dreamed of reclaiming Gucci's high-class reputation, and the timing was perfect. In the 1980s, the fashion world started to take notice of Italy. Milan was becoming the new Paris, and Maurizio saw a golden opportunity. Gucci could lead the new wave of Italian fashion, but only if it refocused on the upscale market. When his father died in 1983, Maurizio prepared to make his move. He had inherited $230 million and half the shares of the Gucci company. Encouraged by Patrizia, Maurizio tried to seize control and redefine Gucci as a label exclusively for the super rich. But his uncle and his cousins owned the other 50% of the fashion empire and they wouldn't budge. Why would I want to listen to Maurizio Gucci when I am Paolo and I know what is best for the company? Everyone was very rich, and so the heirs obviously, you know, they got greedy like everyone else. They wanted to keep this uh, gravy train going, and uh, that was in conflict with what Maurizio Gucci wanted. With all of his business maneuvering, Maurizio had less patience for Patrizia 
and less time for their two daughters. Patrizia was nattering at him and criticizing him and complaining that he wasn't enough of this, he wasn't doing enough of that, and she could do better. She had her way with him for a while, but at a certain point, he just had enough. One day, he packed his bag, it was just an overnight bag. He told uh, Patrizia and the girls he was going down to Florence to the Gucci factory and headquarters for, for a business trip, and he kissed them goodbye, and he left and he never came back. Patrizia had grown accustomed to $900 bedroom slippers, daily visits to the most fabulous Milanese hair salon, $300,000 shopping sprees, all the perks of being a Gucci wife. Even after the separation, she kept a close eye on Maurizio's financial affairs. Just as Maurizio was ready to pull the trigger on his plan to restructure the company, a bombshell hit. His resentful cousin, Paolo, had sent Italian authorities a dossier proving that Maurizio had purchased his million-dollar yacht using funds from his father's old offshore accounts, a clear case of tax evasion. When Italian authorities came for Maurizio, he panicked hopped on his motorcycle and headed for his country villa in the Swiss Alps. Maurizio worked the phone in an effort to push his relatives out of the company and take it over once and for all. Soon he found an Arab investment group willing to help him do just that. He knew which cousin would be the first to sell. He told the investors to approach Paolo. Paolo hated Maurizio, but loathed his own father and brothers even more. Paolo's decision to sell at the end was, was revenge, and he knew it. It was just a matter of time before the remaining relatives sold out to the investment company. Eventually, Maurizio was cleared of the tax evasion charges. He was now free to run the company as he saw fit. In a company, once when someone has more than 50% control, they basically have uh, the power to make a lot of decisions over the company. And once Mauricio was able to convince, you know, one member to come along, it pushed him past that threshold. And uh, so the other family members obviously had no other choice. They had to sell out because their 10, 20, 15% was really going to be worthless. Maurizio was now the only Gucci at the Gucci company. And he was finally able to revamp the Gucci name. On his watch, a young designer named Tom Ford came on board and overhauled the line. Gucci would now mean high fashion and not just shoes and handbags. But it was too much, too fast. By getting rid of all that low-end licensing, the company lost $100 million. Maurizio's personal finances suffered too, to the tune of $40 million. Maurizio still managed to hold on to his two Ferraris, his yacht, and his Swiss chalet. But he slashed Patrizia's monthly allowance from $150,000 to $90,000. Senora Gucci was boiling mad, but mad enough to kill? Investigators needed to find out. Maurizio Gucci had wrestled control of the Gucci fashion empire, but the victory was a mixed blessing. The power struggle had earned him more enemies than friends. Now, to add insult to injury, Maurizio was driving Gucci to the verge of bankruptcy. Still, he forged ahead, convinced that he could turn it all around and take the company to greater heights. But poor Maurizio never inherited his grandfather's business sense. Family is really a double-edged sword for any business because the founder has the genius and the drive to start it, and then the next generation may well be able to extend it and develop it. But historically, and not just in fashion families, but in many families, the third generation just kind of wastes it. 
the company and its fearless leader were hemorrhaging money. By September 1993, Maurizio's Arab-financed partners, InvestCorp, tried to stop the bleeding. They fired Maurizio. Any investor like an InvestCorp is going to invest in a company like Gucci wants an exit strategy. They're not just there to, uh, you know, see the little business grow here and there. They want the big payday. For the first time in its storied history, there were no more Gucci's at Gucci. Maurizio got some $120 million for his shares of the company. It seemed like a fair deal to him, but his estranged wife, Patrizia, went berserk. First, her income had been slashed. Now, her status as a Gucci heiress was crumbling. The humiliation was too much to bear. It's not only a question of wealth, it's a question of power. In this way, she knew she no longer counted. She could no longer be the first lady of Gucci. Patrizia felt that she was responsible for Gucci's success. And now, Maurizio had thrown it all away. She started telling people that she wanted to teach him a lesson. At a lavish birthday party for her daughter, Patrizia asked a famous Milanese lawyer what would happen to her if she got rid of Maurizio. When she asked him the same question again a month later, he sent her a letter advising her to stop talking like that. She didn't take his advice. She went to her household staff and asked them if they could help her find a killer or the husband of the cleaning lady, if he would uh, be willing to kill Maurizio. Soon, thoughts of Maurizio's demise consumed her. This had become an obsession for Patrizia. She had become so resentful toward her husband that she would ask many people how she should kill him. But then, in the spring of 1992, Patrizia Gucci was diagnosed with a brain tumor the size of a billiard ball. Patrizia told me that the day she was being wheeled into the operating room to have a brain tumor removed, Maurizio failed to show up. Luckily, the tumor was benign, but doctors did not want to add to her stress. They asked ex-husband Maurizio not to come to the hospital to support her. Instead, he sent flowers signed simply, Maurizio Gucci. She didn't get over it. She kind of logged it as one of many wrongs that she felt that he had done to her. When investigators uncovered Patrizia's journal, they found a disturbing entry. After the operation, she wrote, Vendetta, revenge. On November 19th, 1994, after almost 10 years of separation, Maurizio and Patrizia's divorce became final. Most divorcees would be thrilled with an annual stipend of $850,000 and homes in Milan, New York, and Monte Carlo, but Patrizia called the offer a mere plate of lentils. This little carnivore wasn't going to settle for anything less than prime rib. Not long after being ousted from his family business, Maurizio Gucci seemed to have a new lease on life and a new girlfriend, a Milan socialite named Paola Franchi. The lovebirds moved in together and built quite a nest. Together, they renovated a huge flat on Milan's posh Corso Venezia and filled it with exquisite art and furnishings. A location where the rent alone was a hefty quarter of a million dollars a year. Patrizia, the ex Mrs. Gucci, grew livid, and not just because Maurizio had found a new love. Patrizia was very worried, both that he would spend it all away and if by chance. Paola should have children, then they would inherit, and then there would be nothing for her, because she was essentially spending the daughter's money. Maurizio was spending hand over fist, and money was going out a lot faster than it was coming in. 
Since his departure from Gucci, he'd yet to find the kind of job that could keep a girlfriend and an ex-wife happy for long. He still had millions in Gucci money, but when Patrizia found out that he was using it to finance risky ventures like casinos and shipping, she panicked. Maurizio was a lousy businessman. If he kept going like he was, he could lose it all, and she would be left penniless. But if something unfortunate were to happen to Maurizio, if he was out of the picture, the money would be safe. Patrizia turned to her best friend, a woman named Pina Oriema, and asked for advice. Pina shared Patrizia's interest in clairvoyance and the occult. Certainly, they could figure out what to do if they put their minds together. Pina would take her around to, to these people. So they really resorted to these kind of superstitions and spells. The Italian press called Pina La Maga Nera, the Black Witch. Together, she and Patrizia had explored a world of fortune tellers and mediums. Now, they were planning a murder. Tina and Patrizia may have dabbled in the dark arts, but murder was a whole different story. Pina contacted a doorman at a sleazy hotel in a dicey part of Milan. He was just a petty thief, but he said he'd try to find someone to do the job. When Pina told Patrizia that he needed a down payment, she complied. As the days turned into weeks, Patrizia grew more and more impatient. Patrizia kept insisting to Pina, asking, why isn't this homicide taking place? Why is Maurizio still alive? Months have gone by, and I'm getting tired of waiting. I have paid money. At that point, in order to get out of the middle, Pina introduced the doorman directly to Patrizia, and from then on, Patrizia handled the situation. Now, with Patrizia in control, the plan moved into action. March 27, 1995, 8.30 a.m. A gunman followed Maurizio Gucci, the former chairman of the fashion powerhouse, into his office building and pumped four bullets into his body. Then hopped into a getaway car and vanished into the streets of Milan. As the body was being brought to its final rest, controversy swirled around the homicide you don't have people gunned down in cold blood and broad daylight in milan every day of the week witnesses identified the killer as a 40 to 45 year old man in a denim jacket and a baseball cap investigators knew that the victim had his share of enemies from his years of bitter business dealings but Maurizio's girlfriend, Paola, pointed the finger toward another suspect. It was indicated by Paola Franchi that it was pretty clear that Patrizia was looking for a killer that could murder her husband. On the day of the killing, Patrizia Reggiani Gucci made another entry in her journal. The one um, that was on the day that Maurizio died was Paradisos, which was a Greek for, for paradise. If you're going to plan a murder, don't uh, document it in, in your diary. But Patrizia was a woman on a mission. The day after the murder, she stormed Maurizio and Paola's luxurious love nest, loaded for bear. Her ammo? Eviction papers filed on behalf of Maurizio Gucci's daughters less than three hours after the murder. Paola Franchi was to collect her belongings and hit the road. The ex-wife was moving in. While Patrizia luxuriated in her new home, investigators struggled to piece together the case. The ex-wife was a suspect, but there were plenty of business associates to rule out as well. Prosecutors spent day after day in the Gucci home office, searching for dark secrets or the slightest hint of a murder plot. 
they came up empty-handed. They also revisited the mafia angle. Tra l'altro, gestivo numerosi collaboratori di giustizia. I also dealt with many informants, or stool pigeons. During the investigations, I would repeatedly ask them if they knew anything about the Gucci homicide. None of them ever told me that homicide could have anything to do with organized crime. Nessuno di loro mi ha mai detto che quell'omicidio poteva interessare la criminalità organizzata. The case was getting cold. Two years went by. Investigators were sure that Patrizia had something to do with the killing, but they had no way to connect her to the shooter. Then, out of nowhere, Filippo Nini, chief of the state police, got an unexpected call from a down-and-out restaurateur named Gabriella Carpanese. He said he knew who killed Maurizio Gucci. Chief Nini arranged to meet Carpanese at a cafe in the seedy section of Milan. I arrived with my driver, who stopped here with his car. I got out and on foot went toward the end of the street. Ten feet away, on the opposite side of the street, I recognized Carpanese, who had described himself as a very tall, heavy-set person with a red jacket. Carpanese told Nini that a man named Ivano Savioni was bragging about his involvement in the Gucci murder. Savioni was a doorman at a sleazy hotel and a friend of Pina Oriemas. It was very important, Carpanese's collaboration. He was at our disposal. He wore a wire. We convinced him to speak with Savioni to hear directly from Savioni what he told us. On tape, Savioni said that Patrizia's friend Pina had contacted him about killing Maurizio Gucci. Savioni called a pizzeria owner he knew, and the pizza man contacted a mechanic who lived behind his restaurant. The mechanic agreed to do the job. Unbelievable. Patrizia had millions at her disposal, and what kind of a gang does she hire? A tarot card enthusiast, a porter at a flea bag hotel, a pizza man, and a mechanic. It's a miracle the plan ever got off the ground. Patrizia didn't have the slightest inkling that the cops would unravel her plot. For two years, Patrizia lived in luxury in the apartment that Maurizio had furnished for his girlfriend, Paola, with her two daughters and thought that she had gotten away with murder. Little did she know police were closing in on her. They tapped her phones and surveilled her activities. Now, cops finally had enough evidence for an arrest. On January 31st, 1997, at 4.30 a.m., they surprised her at home. She asked the police officers to wait for her a moment, and when she came back, everybody gasped because there she was in a full mink fur and gold and diamond jewelry. That's Patrizia. Patrizia Reggiani said she absolutely did not want to give up her jewelry or her fur because wherever she went, they went with her. We let her go and the first thing the guards did in jail was to confiscate her jewels and put them into a box. She had once told reporters, it's better to cry in a Rolls Royce than to be happy on a bicycle. Now, Patrizia was going to find out what it was like to sob in a jail cell. Three years after the shooting death of Maurizio Gucci, his ex-wife Patrizia and her accomplice, Pina Oriema, awaited their court dates from the confines of Milan's San Vittore prison. The prosecution had a solid case against Patrizia, but they wanted more hard evidence. In the months leading up to trial, they raided her jail cell and turned up some incriminating bank statements. The documents showed withdrawals in the exact amount that Savioni, the doorman who hired the killer, said he received. 
If that wasn't enough, Patrizia's best friend turned on her. According to Pina, Patrizia had promised to shower her jail cell with gold if she would keep quiet. But what good would gold do her behind bars? Pina's lawyer advised his client to strike a deal and cooperate. Three months before the trial, that's just what she did. After the court documents were delivered, I read them and I told Pina that the life sentence was a serious risk. I told her to think about it and she decided to confess. And another thing, I was afraid that Patrizia was planning something. The trial was shaping up to be a sensational event, and the press was all over it. A vengeful ex-wife and her psychic friend accused of cutting down a member of a famous Italian family. The drama was too spicy to ignore. I'm certain that there was always a sentimentality about uh, the whole Gucci legacy, the family, you know, the different scandals that went on through the years, and then obviously this murder. This was a big deal in Italy, and it was all over Italian news. With so much evidence against her, everyone wanted to know how Patrizia planned on defending herself. The trial got underway in May of 1998. Patrizia's lawyers did not dispute that their client was soliciting people to bump off her husband. Instead, they offered the brain tumor defense. Patrizia claimed that her surgery in 1992 rendered her incapable of planning a murder. But would a jury really buy that excuse, especially since she told so many people about her murderous intentions? So she admits that she asked everybody in town to kill Maurizio, but then she claims she's incapable of actually planning a murder. That's a tough one to swallow. Then, the second piece of Patrizia's defense is unveiled. She claims that Pina put together the gang on her own and then came to her demanding money. Patrizia said that Pina and her gang threatened to go public and then threatened to harm her daughters. It is still unclear to me what exactly happened in the relationship between Patrizia and Pina and who pushed who. Then, Patrizia was dealt a severe blow. The getaway driver, Orazio Cicala, confessed, hoping for leniency. At that point, it was at that point, the famous document was introduced. Cicala declared to Reggiani on a piece of signed paper, I was paid and I don't want anything else. This was one of the most important pieces of evidence at the trial. Patrizia Gucci did her best to play the good girl in court. Instead of her usual mink coat and designer clothes, she wore plain cotton slacks and twirled a string of rosary beads. But it would take more than a wardrobe change and rosary beads to get Patrizia out of this mess. After months of testimony in the Maurizio Gucci murder trial, jurors took just seven hours to come up with a verdict. They found Patrizia Gucci and her four accomplices guilty. With the exception of the gunman who received life in jail, they all got between 25 and 29 years. As the ringleader, Patrizia was sentenced to 29 years. With good behavior, she could get out while she's still in her 60s. At that point, she'll probably go back to living off her daughter's Gucci inheritance. But for now, prison is a far cry from her palatial home on the Corso Venezia. In jail, she has endured attacks by other inmates and bouts of seizure stemming from the brain tumor she had removed in 1992. Patrizia Reggiani has suffered being in jail, and this was not the way her plan was supposed to work out. Her daughters, Alessandra and Allegra, both support their mother and avow her innocence. In fact, the younger daughter, Allegra, 
began studying law with the expressed motive of helping to free her mother. The family filed a new appeal based on familiar grounds. They produced medical evidence suggesting that Patrizia's brain tumor and subsequent surgery left her without the ability to know what she was doing. I've heard some pretty wild defenses in my day, but the insanity defense for taking out a contract on someone, pretty far-fetched. In July 2004, the Italian courts agreed to reopen the case. Meanwhile, the Gucci company has expanded to become the Gucci Group. Today, it is one of the premier fashion companies in the world. Gucci is this kind of miracle story of a house that grew and then crashed spectacularly and then, amazingly enough, reappeared out of the ashes. Gucci became everything Maurizio dreamed it could be, although there isn't a single family member involved in the publicly held firm. Today, the house of Gucci is known exclusively for its high-end fashions, not for the lowbrow squabbling of the family it's named for. The Gucci saga really shows that sometimes fact can be more incredible than fiction. You have a son who sends his father to jail, a cousin who sends his cousin into exile. You have an ex-wife who has her husband gunned down in broad daylight. And if you tried to make the story up, nobody would believe you. In December 2004, the grand reopening of the La Scala Opera House was broadcast live on giant screens all over Milan even at San Vittori Prison. In earlier days, Patrizia Gucci would have had the best seats in the house. I'm sure she never imagined she'd be watching the La Scala premiere from behind bars. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.